Uh, we're just going to wait a few minutes for more people to trickle in. <laughs> All right, uh, we're gonna get started. Um, good afternoon and welcome to the spring 2022 QSI Colloquium Series. We're so excited to have you all here today. My name is Tyrone Bass and I'm a Senior Development Fellow at QSI Institute. Before we begin, we would like to express our gratitude for Mr. Ross Guerin and Ms. Hong Su uh, for their generous donation, which provided sponsorship for this event. A few operational notes. At the end of this session, we'll adjourn to a standard Zoom meeting for a remote cocktail coffee hour where we can chat more informally with one another. Um, we also want to ensure that you are aware of our upcoming High School Datathon for Justice workshop, which is scheduled for the weekend of April 8th to April 10th, 2022. Based on the success of our previous Datathon, we have decided to adapt the event for the high school level. We are currently looking for partner high schools to participate in the event. If you or anyone you know are interested, please email a chief of operations, Jude Higdon, and we'll post their email in the chat. We're also hosting our inaugural Squared Justice Conference on April 16th, 2022. Squared, a dynamic virtual poster style conference is an opportunity for undergraduate and graduate students to present their social justice research to our community of fellow researchers, social justice scholars and activists. Research at all levels from ideation through data collection analysis and final outcomes and recommendations are invited and welcome more information in chat. Finally, we would like to invite you to register for our data, -thon for justice, our data for Justice conference taking place on April 22nd, 2022. Uh, we're thrilled to announce that our keynote speaker this year will be the amazing Danielle Wood from the MIT Media Lab. More information about the speaker list and registration can be found on the QSide website and we'll post the link in the chat. Please note that financial assistance for registration for both events is available, and you can reach out to QSide at QSide.org for more information. We'd also like to encourage any of you who are joining us today who are not officially members of our affiliate program or our consortium to consider joining. The affiliate program is free to join. The consortium program is a paid membership program, although, wish, although anyone wishing to join can apply for a scholarship if budgets are tight. Links to those are in the chat now. Today's colloquium is the seventh installment in the exciting programming we have planned for the 21-22 academic year. Our colloquium series features nine fantastic talks that will discuss issues related to theory, activism, and technical tools to shed light on a broad range of topics related to inclusion, diversity, equity, and social justice. Please visit our colloquium webpage and consider registering for and sharing information about the other talks we have planned with colleagues who may be interested. To watch colloquium talks by our fall speakers, please visit the QSide colloquium playlist on our YouTube channel. Uh, if you would like to support QSide in the production of more exciting research and activism initiatives, we graciously appreciate any and all donations made to our organization. Your support keeps us going. While we may be on Zoom, it is important to note that the land on which QSide is constituted, what is now known as Williamstown, Massachusetts, is originally and rightfully the land of the Mohican people. We acknowledge that QSide is currently operating on land taken from the Mohican people through genocide, colonialism, and forced relocations, both past and present. We acknowledge that these forces are historic and ongoing to highlight that this land acknowledgement exists not only in the past tense, but also in the present and future, as the Mohican people continue to be denied their rightful claim to this land. We thank the Mohican people for their resistance, resilience, and their stewardship of the land we stand on. 
We acknowledge that this statement is merely a start and decolonization must exist in action, not just words. QSide promises to stand along with the native people of this land and to fight injustices of colonialism, both in its legacy and its ongoing harm. We are sharing a toolkit made by resource generation in the chat for those wondering where to begin on taking action to support indigenous populations present and future. As we progress through the session today, we welcome questions for our speaker using the Q&A uh, feature of the webinar. Keep in mind your questions will only be visible to the host and the speaker, and we'll have time at the end of the presentation for some answers. And now, it's my great privilege to introduce today's speaker, Assistant Dean of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, and Assistant Professor of Internal Medicine and Pediatrics at the University of Minnesota, Dr. Taj Mustafa. Dr. Mustafa received her MD from the University of California, San Francisco, and completed her combined internal uh, medicine and pediatrics residency training at the University of Minnesota. She's an assistant professor of internal medicine and pediatrics at the University of Minnesota, and serves at the assistant dean for diversity, equity, and inclusion for the med school, as well as the chief of equity strategy for M Health Fairview. Her academic interests focus on assessment as, as they relate to both education and healthcare delivery with special attention to equity and inclusion. In her talk today, Dr. Mustafa sheds light on the barriers to equity fundamental to the foundation of modern science and healthcare delivery in the United States and addresses how current avenues of institutional redress can lead to increased disparity rather than diminished. Her talk seeks to expose some of these inequalities and to generate discussion about the role of data science in overcoming such barriers in the future. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tyrone. And thanks so much for inviting me here. I need to express my excitement over being a part of this community and having the opportunity to share my passion for health equity. So as you know, as mentioned, I'm a practicing physician in internal medicine and pediatrics, and my area of research for the past several years has been in assessments and evaluation, including things like decisional, like clinical decision-making tools and the intersection between those things and equity. So I started my career with a firm interest in health equity and healthcare and access to healthcare. And then I became interested in assessments and evaluations because as I progressed in my academic career, I saw this huge disconnect between the metrics that were being generated from these assessments and what quite frankly, I knew to be true from my own lived experience, from the experience of people in my community, other people of color, color, and then the experience of multitude, other historically marginalized communities. Those experiences were not reflected or represented in the metrics or assessments that were being used in healthcare and continue to be used in healthcare. The more I looked, the more I realized that this was the case, not only because yes, medicine has a sordid history, but because even people who had really good intentions were making critical errors in data use, instrument design, and metric deployment. Now, I could give a whole talk just about the data describing health disparities, but quite frankly, there are a ton of those talks already out there, and a lot of people who are more dynamic speakers than I am have given them, so you should look those up. But given the mission of the QSide Consortium, I really wanted to highlight what I'm hopeful is going to be actionable information for quantitative data science. And with that, I'm going to hopefully conquer the first hurdle, which is projecting my slides. All right. So like I said, I'm going to talk about how research conducted with the goal of addressing inequity can go wrong. Specifically, I'm gonna focus on how best intentions, particularly in how we use and understand data and metrics, often fail to improve disparities or worse, exacerbate them. Because once we know and understand those pitfalls, then we can actually address them directly in research and project design and execution and get moving on a path towards health equity. Okay, so I would be remiss to not provide at least a couple of reference points describing health disparities. 
but I'm certain that many of you have already seen maps or graphs similar to this in the news. And this one depicts the dis disparate impact of COVID on BIPOC communities. Illustrated in this map is the burden on Black communities. Another disparity which is gaining some sunlight in popular press are those that exist in maternal infant health. One of those disparities is infant mortality rate, which is over twofold higher for babies whose moms are Black compared to those whose moms are white. There is no shortage of graphs and maps showing disparities in health. And with few exceptions, the disparities show improved outcomes for white patients compared to Black and Indigenous patients in particular. Adult hypertension, another example. Difficulty accessing care. Overall life expectancy. There are so many more demonstrated disparities. And as I said, just describing the disparities could be a talk in itself. There are disparities in cancer survival rates, chronic disease burden, as well as morbidity and mortality from myriad infectious diseases like rotavirus in children, hepatitis C in adults, pneumococcus in the elderly. My point is people have been describing the problem for a while. So why aren't we moving forward? How is it that population science has been sounding the alarm of equity and we're not getting any movement. The overarching answer is that it's really complex and hard and requires multiple institutions of power to prioritize equity and not everyone's interested in equity. And that's true. There are multiple factors that contribute to health. And we'll come back to this, but I want to just orient you to this health cycle. Let's start in the yellow part of the cycle and we'll move clockwise. The yellow represents the upstream contributors to health. This represents a realm where history, policy, institutional power and prejudice interact. For example, an upstream cause is discriminatory hiring practices or discriminatory enforcement of laws or policies or redlining. Thus, kind of all the work that's been highlighted that QSIDE has been doing is related to health. It's in its upstream level. Next, the first green segment is living conditions. Using the example of redlining, you can see how upstream policies and discrimination can directly affect living conditions between populations. Redlining resulted in Black communities having categorically different access to living spaces like public parks and other services, as well as an increased burden of things like environmental toxin exposure. The next green section is about individual risk behaviors. So again, this is influenced by the factors that preceded it. If you don't have a safe outdoor park to play in, there's gonna be a higher chance that you're less likely to play outside and therefore more likely to engage in sedentary behaviors. So while those risks are individual, they can't be divorced from the preceding factors or the environmental contributors and the upstream causes. The yellow portion of the cycle combined with the first two green portions are all together often described with the term social determinants of health. Then the last green section is where health services come in. This is where we raise questions like, who has access to care? Where are clinics located? What insurance is accepted? What's the quality of care people receive? Then the last segment in maroon is the data we collect. We collect data on health and healthcare outcomes. And I'll be focusing on these last two segments mostly, the green, the last green and the maroon for the remainder of the talk, because while most of health happens in that upstream area, most of healthcare funding and most of the dollars are in those last two segments. So I wanna focus on what healthcare can do, especially for those of us who are already on board with equity. For those of us that wanna earnestly achieve health equity, what is the work that we can contribute to to help healthcare institutions actually advance equity? I'm gonna describe three key ideas that end up undermining well-intended efforts to improve equity in healthcare. And then I'll talk about the path forward. The first idea is that medical research is still largely applies a flawed construct of race. I'm gonna spend more time on this example than the subsequent two because there's a bit to unpack here. So first, let's start with the good intentions. Almost all of the intent involved in collecting race data in modern medical research, at least over the past 20 years or so, 
is because it's a deliberate attempt to address oversights of the past. Race is collected to demonstrate diversity in sample populations and therefore hopefully bolster the argument regarding the general applicability of study results. Small racially homogeneous and geographically limited populations have notoriously been the source of poorly performing models, such as the original childhood growth charts, which were based on a small cohort of white Midwestern children and did not apply widely. Additionally, there is increased appetite to develop models that actually address health disparities. Healthcare wants to do this work. And there's a desire to figure out ways to do so at the individual patient care level. And we'll come back to that point, that the biomedical construct of care is based on a profession and a discipline that intervenes at the individual level. It's not a public health framework. It's research based on a focus and desire to improve individual patient outcomes. And I know I said I wasn't going to talk about the sort of history of medical inequities, and I'm not, but I think it's important for us to kind of understand medical science's history in order to understand why there is this flaw in how race is used in our modern research. The rigorous study of medicine using the scientific method to test hypotheses is actually pretty new. In fact, most of the history of medicine is actually muddled by medicine's attempts to find a scientific basis for sociologic phenomena. The social science behind studying human diversity in terms of race is actually a much more recent science than the pseudoscientific movement of eugenics, which is part of medicine's history. The eugenics movement started and persists by conflating understandings of genetics and Mendelian inheritance with social categorizations such as race. Now, again, this could be a whole talk and people have given great talks on this topic. I think if you are interested in this, I would highly recommend Dorothy Roberts' book, Fatal Invention, and Angela Cini's book, Superior, both which give a lot more rich history about this. Now, the research that continues to debunk race-based medicine and demonstrate human equality from a biological fitness standpoint is really difficult for biomedical researchers to reconcile with the fact that different racial groups have different health outcomes, right? It kind of does not compute. Biomedicine wants to explain everything using only a biomedical lens. And therein lies the problem. Because where we need to go is not an ignorance of social phenomena, but a proper consideration of them. Racism is real, but race cannot be used as a stand-in for clinically significant genetic variability. We need to marry social science research that seeks to understand racism with biomedical research, but not confuse the two. I'm gonna give you an example of how that confusion is currently playing out. Race is used as a biological construct, so akin to something like genetics, across a multitude of clinical decision tools and guidelines, from estimates of kidney function, which we're going to take a deeper dive into, to how we dose transplant medications, estimations of heart care health, uh, uses as a modifier in understanding lung performance, um, and as a decision-making uh, tool when we think about screening for things like colon cancer. And that's only a sample of the tools used every day in practice by healthcare providers. And these are built on studies where race was used as a biological construct. So let's take a deeper look at one example. EGFR stands for estimated glomerular filtration rate. You can know that and forget it because essentially it's just a measure of kidney function, but it's only an estimate. Precisely because Measure, measuring kidney function in a precise way is really difficult. And it's actually pretty cost prohibitive to do with any type of regularity. And yet, in a lot of clinical decisions, we need to understand kind of roughly what your kidney function is. So we need a way to quickly estimate it. And EGFR is performed on a basic everyday blood test called the basic metabolic panel. So in fact, most of you, if you've had like routine blood work done, you've had a BMP performed. 
in addition to telling you something about the organ itself, so how the kidney's working and when it might be failing, clinicians also use kidney function to make a ton of other clinical decisions. Lots of drugs rely on kidney metabolism for excretion. So kidney function factors into these everyday and complex risk-benefit decisions that are made all the time in medicine. So for example, right, I uh, may have a patient who has a infection in their blood. And because of the type of bacteria it is, or maybe because of some of their symptoms, I'm concerned that there might be pockets of infection that have seeded into their brain. Now, the difference between treating a blood infection and one that has pockets in the brain is a pretty significant difference in terms of course of antibiotics, right? It's the difference between two weeks and potentially months. Now, to do months of IV antibiotics, I have to subject you to some risks, right? You need a long-term catheter in place, which can actually make you susceptible to other infections, increase your clot risk. It's not benign. So I need to be really careful about this decision. Um, in order to figure out what's going on, the best test is a test, an imaging test called the contrast MRI. Some of you may have had MRIs before. Well, if your kidney function is below a certain threshold, the test itself could result in a fatal reaction. So I want to know your kidney function to make the best possible clinical decision. This, the problem you're presenting with has kind of nothing to do with your kidneys, but I still need to know your kidney function. If I estimate it too low, then I'm not going to do my test and I might not diagnose you correctly. If I estimate your kidney function to be higher, I might actually subject you to a test that could gravely harm you. So this is why kidney function tests are super important. The best intention here is to develop an accurate measure of kidney function. Great. The study pictured was a landmark study that considered multiple variables known to be associated with kidney function. Things like sex, age, diagnosis of diabetes, blood pressure, different types of serum electrolytes. They looked at a number of biological variables and race. And once the analyses were done, the data showed that the sample of people who were identified as black in their study would have their kidney function underestimated in their model if race were excluded. When they incorporated race into their model, the estimation became more accurate. Okay, so we talked about how important accurate yet easily obtained measure of kidney function is. The goal of these authors was to do just that, help to find a more accurate measure. Good intentions. What resulted were estimates that included a race adjustment, where the EGFR calculation is multiplied by about 20% for patients identified as Black. Now, subsequent studies since this study and other models have been generated, and all those studies continue to examine race in relation to EGFR, including a couple of studies published just last year. The result of those models is that in the final EGFR that I get as a clinician in the exam room, I get two numbers. It reports EGFR if Black, EGFR if non-Black. And then it's up to me as a clinician to apply the appropriate number to an individual patient in front of me. So I just choose the number based on my understanding of a patient's race. Now let's break down why that's problematic. Because how do we define race? So pictured here are the Eilmer twins, they're fraternal twins. In the small box, you can see a picture of the Eilmer family with all their siblings. You may have seen the twins before. They've appeared on a lot of talk shows internationally because people are fascinated by the way in which they look different. So let's ask ourselves, do these twins have different ancestry or heritage? If you do a pedigree chart by race or ethnicity, would it look different? No, they're fraternal twins, of course not. But now think, if you just visually saw them, not together, by themselves, they come in, right? They're in your ER, they're sick and confused and they can't have a great conversation with you. And you need to apply an estimated GFR, one if black and one if non-black. Which estimate would you use? Would you use the same one for each sister? Because again, what is race, right? Simply and very simply, race is a category of humankind that shares certain distinctive physical traits. 
That's literally the definition. Now to support slavery and racism, many countries, including our own, enacted laws linking race to ancestry, right? Giving rise to the notion of things like racial purity and the idea that a person who looks white but has a black grandparent or parent isn't in fact white, but instead is passing for white. Or things like the one drop rule, which has absolutely nothing to do with genetic admixture. Like literally the math doesn't add up. These legal definitions of race, right? Remembering this social determinants of health led to different environmental and social conditions for people based on race. So the legacy of slavery and oppression then created different cultures within geographies based on race. So while race itself is a phenotypic categorization, in racialized societies, it also has cultural meaning for an individual. This is why there is a phenomenon of self-identified race, which is the race a person identified with. These two siblings might share, I don't know, I haven't talked to them, but they might share the same self-identified race. That said, because the nature of race is that it is based on a purely phenotypical categorization, based on social constructs, that's why it also remains scientifically accepted for a third party to assign race based on visual assessment. That's known as socially identified race, or sometimes a street race. Socially identified race is used in some of the most robust studies examining the role of bias in interpersonal communication and in medical decision making. In most parts of the world, including the US, these two sisters have different socially identified races and they will likely experience race differently and have different experiences with racism. In the US, one would have the experience of being black and the other is being white. So if race isn't biological, when we think about our study findings examining EGFR, why was there such a distinctly different curve for kidney function estimation by creatinine clearance, so EGFR, between those who identified as black and those who didn't? Well, biomedicine scratched its head and turned to ancestry. So I don't wanna to dwell too much on this slide other than to point out the fact that the authors put in a lot of work trying to model both self-identified race and ancestry as potential valid modifiers to their model. But they didn't look at the impact of any other social determinants of health. This model considered known biomedical modifiers of kidney function testing, so things like protein intake, body composition, and then they added a single social modifier race. Lots of people before me have talked about how race and ancestry aren't the same thing. And in this study, they wanted to look at those variables separately. Okay, good. But they were using the hypothesis that ancestry would somehow be a relevant biological construct for use in research. Right, thinking after all, shouldn't ancestry improve genetic associations related to geographic origins? The answer to this depends in the outcome that you're trying to predict. We would expect genetic ancestry to have correlation with specific genetic adaptations that are beneficial in some geographies, but only those. The prime example always talked about, but you'll also notice it's one of the only examples because there aren't many, is sickle cell disease. Malaria is found in specific geographies and therefore sickle cell mutations are highly associated with ancestry. And ancestry offers less admixture of geographic origin than race. But there are only a few medically significant conditions that are the result of geographically associated pressures on populations. In fact, most population differences like the retention of lactase or lactose tolerance, which is the enzyme that allows people to digest cow's milk, right? All humans are born with it, but most people lose that enzyme in adulthood. But specific ancestral populations tend to retain functional lactase well into adulthood. And these populations are associated with cultures that rely on cow's milk as an important source of nutrition. Importantly, neither of these geographically associated genetic variations track by race. Sickle cell, prominent Africa, in India, 
Indians considered Asian, Africans considered black, right? Do not track by race. Most clinically significant genetic variations don't track with geographic populations either. So these graphics show neighbor joining trees generated by lining up individuals represented by lines based on genetic similarities. The closer the line, the more genetically similar. So the graphic on the left side of your screen shows a neighbor joining tree across 190 genetic polymorphisms. So as you can see, the lines cluster by old world geographic ancestry. Geographic ancestry, again, isn't race, but is often used to support the genetic basis of race. This type of genetic grouping has a little utility in healthcare, which again, is based on the delivery of care to individuals. The graphic on the right shows the complete lack of geographical ancestry correlation to a genetic, spe to a specific clinically relevant gene. gene. The takeaway here, is that neither race nor ancestry are meaningful biological constructs in clinical medicine. Defining race and why we're using it is not just a teleologic exercise, it's an essential step to address any of the myriad of potential confounders related to the social determinants of health, which are influenced by race. So the particular pitfalls of the EGFR studies are outlined here. Race was originally collected as a demographic variable. It's unclear why, but seemingly to just ensure that the population had a representative sample. In most of the studies, it was never even specified how the race data was collected. And further, it wasn't specified what was self-identified or socially identified, nor the categories you were allowed to pick and if you were allowed to be biracial. Next, Race was analyzed as a biomedical variable and further identified on a binary, black, white only. No other racial categorizations were analyzed. Furthermore, issues with overfitting were completely ignored. In one study, black participants made up about 30% of the development data and only 14% of the validation data. And the authors did know, and I quote, we had a smaller number of black participants and non-black participants in the validation data set. So the estimates of accuracy may be less precise in black persons. And we had an insufficient representation of racial and ethnic groups other than black and white. So they doubled down on a biomedical explanation for racial differences instead of exploring additional social determinants of health that might allow for a more accurate model and then admit that the model they generated is going to have less precision for exactly a group that they were concerned would be ill-fitted to the original model if they excluded race. So these best intentions to address health disparities in point of care healthcare delivery, they actually end up obfuscating and exacerbating inequity. Race-based medicine propagates the racist construct that population differences in health are due to biologic differences that track by race. More insidiously, by using race as a biomedical construct, the research models don't actually expand to consider social determinants of health. Next, we're gonna switch into e examination of another idea, that biases that influence assessment results are often ignored, and that's to our peril. So I'll give you the example of patient satisfaction surveys. Patient satisfaction surveys are used for performance feedback for employees and organizations. On the surface, measurement of patient satisfaction makes sense as a way to monitor for variable experiences of different populations, especially historically marginalized populations. So let's talk about the good intentions here, right? Healthcare institutions care about how patients feel. They care about delivering a positive experience to patients, they understand that clinician and staff communication and interpersonal interactions matter. They don't wanna use proxy measures. They wanna hear directly from patients and they wanna use that data for improvement. Fantastic. So what's the problem? Well, it's important to look at where and how and why bias manifests in this process, because when we examine that, we can see why collecting this information isn't actually helping us move closer to equity. It's important to note that patient satisfaction scores are sent to patients in the days following a specific encounter. 
And that can be like a office visit or hospitalization. And patients are then asked to rate the clinician they saw as well as staff in the physical environment. So it's a rating of a specific experience. And health systems then aggregate that data to understand how individual providers are performing as well as how the system's performing overall. The surveys are also randomly administered, so not every patient gets one, and a patient won't get one every time they access care. All right, so what's not working here? Well, multiple population studies demonstrate lower overall trust of healthcare and a belief of receiving lower quality healthcare among historically marginalized racial populations, particularly Black patients. The bar graph on the right side of your screen shows data from a 2020 Kaiser Family Foundation nationwide poll, and it's representative of similar data across multiple other studies. Now, let's contrast that with the study of patient satisfaction scores headlined in the left bottom corner. Consistent with almost all published satisfaction survey data from health systems, that study showed that patient satisfaction scores don't show any adverse disparities for Black patients. So why the discordance? Well, there's two likely contributing factors. One has to do with access, right? But I think the more interesting one has to do with the type of questions that are asked and the way they're asked. So these patient satisfaction instruments use liquor type scales and right from kind of below expectations exceeds expectations. Those can norm to the patient's expectations of care. So if you've been treated poorly and expect to be treated incredibly poorly, and instead you're just treated okay, you might actually give incredibly high marks because the care you received literally exceeded your expectations. Because we don't ask every patient every time, we're not capturing all the events of care. And because we don't ask specifically about feelings of discrimination or disrespect, we're likely not capturing the concerns that black and brown patients have about the care they're receiving. So in addition to failing to capture disparities in care experience, there's actually an additional problem with patient satisfaction surveys. Patients rate women and non-white physicians lower than white physicians overall, and those differences are exacerbated when accounting for quality of care, meaning that looking at care quality by examining things like diagnostic accuracy, timeliness of communication, appropriateness of care, adherence to best practice guidelines, and multiple other objective quality metrics. As those metrics improve, so as a physician provides higher quality care, their scores go up if they're white or male, but if they're not, if they're non-white, they're a woman, their scores don't significantly change and may trend downward. So let's take a minute to unpack why that might be. So again, we look at expectations. So gendered expectations of performance persist across professional roles. We expect female physicians to be more empathetic than male physicians. We expect them to spend more time, be more relational. If they do those things, they aren't exceeding our expectations. They're just meeting them. If a male physician shows those behaviors, we think he's exceptional. Additionally, we don't like women to be assertive or decisive. But to provide excellent medical care, sometimes they need to be. This is why scores for women may decrease with higher quality because they get penalized for these agentic traits. Similarly, racial biases influence our expectations of what it means to be a doctor. This is most pronounced on expectations of appearance, but also on things like accent, vernacular, and word choice. And that's at its most benign. At its worst, Explicit racial biases influence patient satisfaction ratings of non-white providers. So before we talk about why that's problematic, even though I think you all know why that's problematic, I do want to point out one more thing, which is it's important to know that diversity in the healthcare workforce leads to improved health equity. So we really want to do our best to support diversity in the workforce. Pictured are two Institute of Medicine reports. They're actually 20 years old. They, they're the ones that first outlined these issues. And since that time, there's actually been a bunch of studies that have shown that, wow, 
when we have a more diverse workforce, we actually increase things like patient engagement for marginalized populations. We get better access and actually have more appropriate care. And not just that, but for all patients, when you have increased workforce diversity, you actually get improved diagnostic accuracy. And it's important to understand that with all, right, wanting a diverse workforce, when you have an incentive metric that may surreptitiously actually penalize diversity, then that becomes very problematic. So not only does patient satisfaction scores fail to capture important differences in patient population experience, it masks disparities, right? It's, it's actually the pool data that's not problematic. It's how it's used at the individual healthcare system level, right? Because a healthcare system can look at something like that Kaiser Family Foundation study or any study talking about how black and brown patients are not having good experiences in healthcare. And then what they do is say, well, what does our data show? And they turn to patient experience data and they look at it and they say, oh, well, that study must not be about us. That's not because of us. We're doing a great job because look at our scores. We're seeing no population differences. Equally importantly, those metrics penalize women and non-white employees. And those metrics, patient satisfaction metrics, are often incorporated into compensation plans and promotion considerations. And they end up exacerbating disparities through worsening workforce inequities. And the last idea I'm gonna describe before I talk about the path forward, because I do believe there is reason to be optimistic, even though I'm dwelling on some problems for a bit. The final idea that we need to consider is how we use metrics as incentives. So again, first let's talk about good intentions. Healthcare systems should address health disparities. That's a good idea. Healthcare systems have robust amounts of health data. They should collect and analyze this data and use it for improvement. And they should be encouraged to do that. Hospital scores should be consider health equity measures. Reimbursement of care should consider equity measures. The massive healthcare industrial complex should incentivize systems to address health disparities, right? What could go wrong? So I'd like to hone in for a moment on the things that we do measure and currently look at in with an equity lens and the things that we could measure. So a number of things that we measure for reporting requirements and analyze for equity for reporting requirements are health outcomes. In other words, they're the reflections of the entirety of the health equity cycle. Things like mortality, readmission, so that's getting them into the hospital and then coming back within a 30-day window. Things like disease incidence and disease control don't just represent the health care you're, you're getting, but also multiple other social determinants of health. It's a, it's a cumulative effect. In other words, changing how we deliver care to different populations within the walls of a healthcare institution alone are not gonna completely correct for population differences in outcomes that are associated with social determinants of health. So as long as those social determinants persist, you're gonna to continue to see population differences in these outcomes. Now, health profession provision can reduce these disparities or widen them. So of course we should aim for reducing them, but the healthcare delivery itself is just a small part of the entire cycle, and therefore it's gonna have limited effect on health outcomes. On the other hand, healthcare outcomes are wholly controlled by a healthcare system. So these are the differences in the actual care we provide to different populations. A great example is how we treat peripheral arterial disease or poor blood flow to the limbs. In a large national study, Black patients were much more likely than their white counterparts, even when controlled for socioeconomic status and disease severity, to have their limbs amputated instead of less invasive procedures to restore blood flow and save their limbs. So you can imagine amputation has significant implications for quality of life, maintenance of the same line of work, mental wellness. Other clear healthcare outcomes are the outcomes related to things like timeliness. Are there differences between populations and ER wait times? 
how long after you present with like a broken leg before you're given pain medicine? When you present with chest pain, how long does it take for you to be evaluated for a heart attack? Those are measures of timeliness that actually population studies have shown differences by race and gender. So healthcare systems could measure them. Those differences are a direct reflection of the healthcare delivery and something that a health system could be wholly responsible for and with directed resources could change. So when we incentivize equity metrics for health outcomes, we actually end up exacerbating inequity because the easiest way for a healthcare system to improve their health equity numbers is to change the denominator. Systems that refuse to take Medicaid or public insurance are a prime example of that tactic. Further, by not requiring equity analyses of healthcare outcome measures, we're not asking healthcare systems to look at the types of things that they could actually directly impact. So finally, here we are. So where do we go? Well, we need to work to overcome the philosophical barrier I outlined at the start. It's important to name it and understand it. The biomedical construct of a population is rooted in the biomedical approach. It can best be summarized by the question, what's wrong with the set of individuals? Do they share a mutation? Were they exposed to the same to toxin? One rule or philosophy that guides a lot of biomedicine is this idea of Occam's razor. What is the simplest explanation for this complex set of symptoms? That's very different from a sociologic population and racial groups are sociologic populations. So when we do medical research, we need to find a way to marry our biomedical approach with a robust sociologic one. One key factor when marrying this approach is to change from a race-based study design to a race-conscious one, which is inclusive of other social determinants. So we can continue to examine the role of race, but we need to do so with a much more nuanced approach and understanding how race interacts with pertinent other sociologic variables, as well as a way that other identities interact with those sociologic variables. Right? We need to use self-identified race when we care about the effects that may be related to racial enculturation and racial social groups. We need to use socially identified race when we care about factors that we think may be influenced by personally mediated racism, particularly in the delivery of healthcare. Next, we need to have a more robust accounting of potential biases and assessment instruments. A lot of this means considering marginalized populations when developing instruments, and that work in the realm of survey development design is only emerging. And we need to separate how we use health outcome data and healthcare outcomes. Healthcare institutions still have a role and will have a role in collecting health outcome data, but that data needs to be mapped not to the institution. It needs to be mapped to populations. <laughs> and responsibility for improvement of that data has to be shared across sectors. That said, healthcare institutions need to start to devote more energy to look at healthcare disparities. With directed resources and effort, a healthcare system could close gaps in healthcare disparities in a relatively short period of time. Health equity means that everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible. And that requires removing obstacles to health, such as poverty and discrimination, their consequences, things like access to good jobs with fair pay, quality education, housing, safe environments, and healthcare. And while I talked about the role of healthcare institutions within the space of healthcare and data use, I do wanna end on a slightly broader proposal. Individual healthcare institutions have a role in breaking the cycle of inequity at every stage, right? These are large organizations that employ large numbers of people. They hold a lot of capital and investments. They purchase a lot of goods. Place-based and mission-based investment 
purchasing to support minority owned businesses and deliberate employment pipeline programs could all impact community social determinants. So while I think it's critically important to address some fundamental flaws in data use in healthcare, I wanna make sure that we don't lose sight of the full spectrum of work ahead for healthcare to actually start advancing health equity. With that, I'm happy to take questions and thanks so much for your time. Wow, um, <laughs> thanks so much, Taj. Oh, goodness, um, I wrote down about 50 questions myself as I was going through, um, and, uh, and many of them you addressed and talked about. Um, so well, uh, thanks so much for, for that. My, I'm going to be digesting this one for a while. Um, so we do have some questions from our attendees. Um, so uh, a colleague asked, uh, is it the case that it healthcare outcome disparities is not getting better? Um, there was a caveat that, that they're not contesting there's a problem they're just wondering inside i think inside of the system do you sense that things are moving in the positive direction or is the problem getting worse yeah so right i i mentioned a number of different disparities um it, there there are some disparities right because disparities just means different there are some disparities that are getting better, but it's not because uh, the health of minority populations are getting better. It's because the health of white populations is getting worse. So there are some disparities that are closing. So things like, uh, quite frankly, just uh, life expectancy, right? Life expectancy for white populations has gone down at a rate faster than it's decreased for minority populations. Always lower for minority populations, it's gotten worse for white people. So there are disparities that are getting better, but not necessarily in the way that we want them to. <laughs> so there are gaps that are closing, but uh, again, we say disparities, I, I think, and I, I use disparities all the time. What we really care about are inequities and then overall improvement in health, right? We don't want to close gaps by making everyone sicker. Like that's not that's not a good idea. <laughs> um, I think the the, the lowering tide uh, sinks all ships is probably a terrible metaphor. Um, but so I I, uh, I feel you there. One of our attendees asked, um, as a black woman sa or says, as a black woman, I found that my quality of care and the care of my family members can actually decline when I demonstrate too much knowledge about the intersections of race and medicine. After asking if uh, her mom's kidney function results were race corrected or correcting our pediatrician when they said my child's head circumference is below average because black people have smaller heads or telling nurses that uh, their above average BP reading after pregnancy is dangerous despite their expectation that I have always had a high BP. Is there research on how patients can effectively use health data literacy to advocate for themselves and loved ones without having a detrimental impact on healthcare delivery? Oh, such a good question. And I appreciate it. And it, it really, it, uh, it's close to my heart. And I, I have not seen, um, nor have I performed research looking at the effectiveness of approaches patients can use in point of care advocacy. Um, so unfortunately, I can't answer the question and say this is exactly what you can do. Um, because I, I think what's hard is that Right, it is it is complex, and you're dealing with this complex power structure where the person you're talking to uh, might not know what you know. Right, is in a position of authority, may have a fragile ego about it, doesn't want to be challenged or ask questions, and has a lot of fragility around racism. Right, and so just bringing it up causes that person to get flustered and defensive, and and right, it all falls apart. I do know um, that there are plenty of uh, practicing physicians, not as many as I would like, but plenty who do understand these phenomena. And so a lot of times it takes extra work, but it is finding a physician, right? And finding that primary care provider um, who does get it and who does understand and, and can give you that high quality of care, which I know is an, is an inadequate answer, but I just, I. 
I can guess at maybe tactics that people can try, but there's there's not research that I've seen at, regarding what pa how patients can effectively advocate in this setting. Well, that sounds like something we need to remedy. Yeah. Uh, Q-siders, swarm, <laughs> let's get this done. Um, I, can, I can say that um, as a, a queer person, um, there are things that happen in my own healthcare experience that I am quite confident that people who are heterosexually identified do not experience. There mm -hmm. is a, almost a whole suite of questions that as soon as my doctor, as soon as I come out to my doctor, it's like, oh, let me get the pink sheet. Um, and um, it's just that it's like, and, and not, not always, but there's always a whole suite of things that they start to bring to the table and assumptions. So it's, it can be quite interesting. Um, so our colleague Atticus asked, to what extent do you think cultural competence and cultural humility trainings have a role in increasing care equity? Do you foresee any useful metrics for evaluating, evaluating patient-centered care to mitigate the challenges, limitations that you outlined in your talk? Yeah, so, um, so cu cultural humility and uh, uh, communication skills um, do have a huge role in increasing uh, care equity. That said, um, trainings themselves are likely not the solution. Um, they're part of the solution. I, I, I'm an educator, right? I love trainings. Um, but, uh, but what increases cultural competence more than training is actually a diverse workforce, right? So when your peers, when you have a diverse set of peers, and that is the conversation that you're in about patient care, right? Care, healthcare is a team sport. We make decisions as a team. Um, when you're getting those diverse perspectives, you improve your ability to care for diverse populations. So to improve cultural competence of care providers, the number one thing that's gonna do it is increasing workforce diversity. Trainings are fine. They're not hurtful. They're not getting the job done though either. <laughs> um, there are lots of places that have instituted robust training programs and it hasn't changed their outcomes, even in things that looking like timeliness to care. Right, there was this really nice study uh, done locally, actually, looking at um, children, so school-age children who came in with a long bone fracture. So this is a, a broken, like kind of upper arm or broken leg, basically a, a, a broken bone that is hard to miss and that we know 100% is painful. If you're a black child, you have to wait longer for pain medicine than a white child does. When you present with this diagnosis that we know is painful, right? No question of pain. This is an abdominal pain or something else, sore throat. We know this is painful. We know you need pain meds. You have to wait longer if you're a black child than if you're a white child. When we do robust training about it, doesn't improve that, um, right? So people can know this, but bias still, still persists in the environment. When you have diverse staff working in the ER, it improves. So I, I, I think we, we really need to focus on that. And then I kind of missed a second part of the question. Um, it's okay, because I think we're, we're bumping up against the, yeah. at the hour. And so um, if, if, if you're able to join us 